This episode of The Meat House is brought to you by Amoretti, the ultimate manufacturer of brewers' natural infusions, craft purees, and concentrates to bring your next batch to the next level. Click on the link in the episode description below to see their full lineup of flavors. Use promo code MEATHOUSE at checkout to save 15% off your next order. Well, since it's summertime, I thought I'd throw in a little bit of coconut music in there. So uh, those of you that are sitting around the patio with your cold glass of beer or mead, uh, and you got the tiki lanterns lit, I uh, enjoy the little intro there. So, uh, But anyway, hey, welcome to the Mead House. And I don't know about where you live, but where I live, it's like 100 degrees. So... Uh, I guess summer's here, guys. What do you think? It's here. Yeah, no. Uh, no, we have ninety percent humidity, and you're good to go. Yeah, <laughs> Mississippi Chris, he's sitting on the back porch tonight uh, for the show. Welcome to the Mead House. This is a show uh, by by mead makers for mead makers, and uh, we don't profess to be any type of professionals. Although we do have our own homegrown, bona fide, uh, certified judge on the staff here at the Mead House. So we're lucky to have Jeff Schaus in the house. Uh, Aaron Martin uh, returning from, I guess it was work, wasn't it? It was. Oh, God. <laughs> Entertaining some uh, out of town co-workers so missed you guys last week it's good to be back back was, in the mead house was, was mead part of the uh, entertainment unfortunately no um these co-workers uh happen not to to drink so um a couple of beers on my part but uh unfortunately we weren't able to uh to pop open any meads while they were here <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, hey, they call me JD Webb. Uh, the Mead House. Uh, that's where I. That's where we live too. It's just simply themeadhouse dot com. You can listen to the live radio show there, or go over to TuneIn Radio if you're a member over there. Listen to it live there. The show is also featured on iTunes, soon to be uh, on Stitcher Radio. That's the podcast version, so you can listen at your leisure. And of course, uh, the download and the uh, and the MP3s are available to listen on our website, the Facebook page. Uh, we're, we're growing in numbers, and simply just type in the Mead House up there in a little search deal on the Facebook. No, we don't tweet. Although, you know, whenever we put a post up on the on the Mead House deal, there, why it, it'll send something out to let people know who may be following us. Um, but no, JD doesn't tweet. Um, a couple of shout outs I wanted to get out of the way here early, guys. Uh, we're going to have a guest on the show, uh, here in just a few minutes. Um, Grady Ogle, uh, I hope I'm saying that last name right, uh, caught up with him over at the Mead Facebook group. He's doing a boche uh, after vacation, and uh, it looks like he may have already done it. I don't know. Um, he says he's never done one, wants uh, some tips and advice, uh, is very much appreciated. And uh, quite a few people have responded over there. Now, I'm, I'm kind of working on my first boche, guys, uh, actually two of them. Uh, with the coffee, I started another coffee experiment. But uh, uh, Jeff, you're, I guess you're more the you're more the expert in the Boche field here amongst the four of us. Uh, any hints or, or anything you can give to Grady as he's uh, working on his Boche? Well, actually, like I mentioned uh, mentioned on Facebook earlier today, um, I do vastly prefer either the crock pot or the uh, with a, the pressure cooker method as far as getting a nice smooth caramelized flavor as opposed to you know burnt and, um well nastier bitter bitter flavors um from the the caramelized honey um and uh, there was some discussion as to whether you know you should use a cheap honey or a uh uh 
a, a different varietal honey. The the prevailing um, opinion here is, you know, you should just use something cheap. Uh, but you know, I I told him he should really check out last week's episode when we talked about your experiment with uh, like the mesquite honey versus the wildflower honey and the different results you got from different times. And uh, right. maybe that would be some interesting data for him there. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was. Uh, and that was, uh, I think it was the last week's show. So uh, if you're if you're listening to this show, you want to learn uh, or know a little bit more about the Boches, check out last week's show, which would have been, what day was that? Like the 21st, I think. Um, what episode? episode 13. Uh, episode 13. I mean, you know, when you're retired, you just forget all that kind of stuff. <laughs> um, another shout out we want to get out of the way here, too, goes out to uh, Gloria Riggs at the Mead Makers Facebook group. Now, guys, she's never made a mead before, but she wants to try it. Uh, she says she's got some red star yeast, some blueberries. Honey and a lot of questions, and uh, I've got four questions here. Do I uh, do I really have to use multiple yeasts? What will happen if I only use one? If I do have uh, to use multiple yeasts, what brands are good, um, non-GMO or organic? I don't want to screw it up. What tips to, to making it easy? I have a three-gallon glass candy dish with a lid. Will that work? Until I'm ready to bottle, uh, any health benefits to me? I, I don't know. I think the jury is even still out on that part. But wow, um, let's take question number one. Does she have to use multiple yeasts? Not really, huh? No. Pick a yeast and learn what it does. Yeah. Uh, she says she's got uh, Red Star yeast, but I don't know. You know, I know Red Star yeast is uh, used in the baking industry too. So I'm hoping that's not the Red Star yeast that she's referring to. Um, yeah, pretty much pick a yeast. Uh, you know, we have our preferences. We like the 71 Bs, uh, any of the D series, D21, D47. 1118 is a very common one out there. These are all Lalvin. Uh, you can go to Lalvin. I, I mean, I, well, I'm not even sure what the website is. is Lalvin.com. Um, if you go to the meathouse.com, uh, look on the uh, left side of the uh, page, and you'll see some links to some uh, resources, and the uh, Lalvin catalog is listed there. She doesn't want to screw it up. What tips uh, to making it easy? Well, first of all, go to our website and look at the uh, orange blossom sweet mead recipe and uh, don't jump into it too quickly. Uh, take your time and, and gather up your equipment. Get the proper equipment, get, get the proper yeast and the proper nutrients. If, you, if you're scared of screwing it up, you need to start with a proven recipe and you need to start with the equipment you need and good ingredients. Otherwise, you really stand a good chance of screwing it up. There's a chance when you when you make your first lead, you're going to screw it up anyway. So why not minimize those chances? Yeah. Well, yeah. go ahead, Jeff. That may have been me. I, I was just oh. going to say, in, in addition to the equipment and the ingredients, you know, Jeff men, or um, Chris mentioned the recipe, and, and to me, part of that is even just the the technique and the protocol that you should follow as well. So, uh, just like Chris said, take the time to read up and, and study to learn what what steps you should take in terms of staggered nutrient additions and degassing. Um, it's it's definitely worthwhile to. Do the homework up front, and, and you'll be glad you did when you're bottled and, and ready to enjoy it. Yeah, I think um, the part that scares me in all these questions just she, she put up is this three-gallon glass candy dish with a lid. Uh, <laughs> I'm not quite sure I understand what a three-gallon glass candy dish is with a lid. But, uh, you know, guys, I, I think the best advice for uh, Gloria is to go to Amazon and look for Ken Schramm's The Complete Mead Maker. I mean, that's pretty much been the Bible for mead makers for a good many years. 
And uh, it's got some really, really good advice. It's got some good, simple recipes. Like Chris said, go to themeathouse.com. Do that uh, that orange blossom uh, mead that we've got listed. It's on the recipe page. You just click the recipe link there at the top of the website. And start with that one. Follow the directions exactly as they're laid out with all of the exact uh, uh, ingredients. And uh, you can't go wrong. Uh I, you know, what, what, what happens when, when you deviate from, and we're going to talk about this here in a little while, but when you, when you deviate from the, uh, the ingredient list and, and the instructions, that's when things happen. And that's when, become, that's when you become unsuccessful uh, and, uh, I, you know, even to the point of just absolutely quitting and giving up. So we don't want you and to And you do get that. on the soapbox list. Yeah, and you get on Mississippi Chris's soapbox list. <laughs> so, but uh, hey, uh, again, welcome to the Mead House, uh, and we might as well just jump right in. This we started, um, uh, we started working on this cherry mead uh, a couple of weeks back, and uh, I think we're—I don't know where are we at, guys. Uh, day sixteen or seventeen with this cherry mead, I think. Chris, I'm sorry, I, you were cutting out on me there. Oh, uh, we're just uh, we're just going to get started on the cherry mead. Uh, I think we've been at this now for about what 16 or 17 days now. We're into the cherry. Uh, I think we're uh, 14 days now, I believe. Okay. Um, we've got one more week to go. Uh, leave it in primary. You should be under airlock, uh, and you're finished with all the nutrient additions, all the stirring, degassing, and everything. Uh, so we're going to leave it for a total of 21 days, and that'll put us next Tuesday, uh, 21 days from the day you pitch the yeast. Uh, at that point, it's been sitting still, so fermentation should be all but complete. Uh, most of your yeast will have settled out, uh, or the majority of it, from primary. Um, and so we're going to be on a two-week break after this show, so I need to give instructions for what people should do uh, while we're gone. Yeah. So next Tuesday, I think, is July the 5th, I believe. Um that's going to be the day you're going to write the secondary, and you're going to need a three-gallon glass carboy, and I suggest getting glass um, and, of course, an airlock and stopper for it. But <clears throat> what we're going to do with this one is we're going to add some Dutch processed cocoa powder, and we're going to add some crushed mollub. Um for three gallons, we're going to add about 12 ounces of Dutch processed cocoa. So uh, once you've got your, your carboy uh, sanitized, uh, go ahead, put your Dutch processed cocoa in there, 12 ounces. Uh, put in about a half a cup or so of crushed mollub. Now, if you buy your mollub uh, in the whole pits, you can just put them in a you know, a sturdy plastic sandwich bag or something and, and roughly crush them with a hammer. Uh, they don't have to be powder or anything. Um, and about a half a cup. If you got a little more, a little less, that's okay. So put those in and, and put your um, um, racking cane and everything in your sanitizer. Get that ready. And then uh, rack the mead from primary over into your uh, three gallon carboy and uh, what you're probably going to want to do is use your lee stir uh, and when you rack the mead over uh, once you get about three or four inches of mead in the bottom of the carboy you're probably going to want to use that to saturate the cocoa powder otherwise it's going to float so once you get all that saturated and mixed up good then you can go ahead and, and top it up into the neck uh, you want it about an inch or less below the bottom of the stopper. And um, then you're just going to let it sit there until we come back from break. And that's all you're going to need to do. Yeah. And if you do come up short, uh, which you shouldn't, uh, you should have way more than enough meat if you followed the recipe. Uh, you could top up with some um, purified water if you needed to. 
actually, the way this recipe was written, you should have almost a gallon extra. So what I would suggest doing is uh, having some extra empty sanitized wine bottles or another half gallon or one gallon um, uh, glass jug, and then go ahead and uh, siphon that leftover mead into that, stopper it, and save it. Uh, if you don't have a stopper to fit a wine bottle, you can just stretch a balloon over it and punch a hole in it with a small pin, a uh, straight pin or something. Yeah. Uh, and keep that mead for topping up later because once uh, once we get done with secondary, we're going to go into another uh, three-gallon carboy to get off the uh, cocoa powder and everything, and we're going to lose some volume there. So you're going to need that extra to, to uh, top up with. Great. And uh, so, yeah, once you get in your secondary uh, carboy there, next Tuesday, uh, all you got to do is uh, wait for us to get back from break because we're going to leave it on there for about a month in secondary. Um, so uh, that's pretty much the update for the cherry mead. Now, you can find all the information on the cherry mead at themeadhouse.com. It's listed uh, right there on the front page, and I believe I also put it in the recipe section as well, parts one and two. So uh, the com- complete re- instructions uh, should be posted there, and uh, we'll review them. I'll have, even, uh, I'll have Chris review them and make sure that we've got everything correctly posted there. Uh, I believe it is, but um, good yeah, stuff. Yeah, we'll, we'll go over it and check it, but uh, if, if not, uh, we'll get it up before next Tuesday, and uh, you got nothing to do until then anyway except sit back and wait. Yeah. Excellent. So, so I think it was two weeks ago that, that I was on the show the last time, and um, I think that was the show that, that Chris put that recipe together live on the air and, and I'm just laughing since then. I, every time I go to a grocery store now, I'm like going down the juice aisle <laughs> and, you know, checking to see what kind of juice they have, you know, the, the tart cherry juice. And I'll tell you, just like you were saying, Chris, that um, Morello cherry stuff is kind of hard to come by. All the tart cherry juice I'm seeing is the Montmorency. So yeah. um, what, what was that place that you told us about? The brownwoodacres.com definitely a good yeah you can get it there uh the actual uh, i don't know why they don't have brownwood acres on the bottle uh it actually says fruit fast on the bottle of concentrate that's right i was like walking down the the grocery store aisle with my phone out and the picture of it you know looking to to find that fruit fast label and uh just well i I do know that kroger uh kroger does have it uh if you're nearby kroger uh, it, and it's not in the juice aisle. It's actually refrigerated over in the produce section. They have all the health food juices and things. Um, and it's a bottle of concentrate over there. Uh, and when I found it, uh, I saw that it said Morello and Montmorency. So I was curious as to, uh, you know, what the uh, ratio was. So I actually called them and I talked to one of the owners of the place. And she said it was like 99% Morello. So um, it, you're getting most of that. That's about as close as you're going to get to Morello cherry juice uh, that I have found anywhere. Yeah. Totally, yeah. And, you know, the the ones I were seeing, it, it either explicitly called out the, the Montmorency or it just said tart cherry and didn't even tell you what was in there. So, um, Yeah, the Montmorency... Uh, you can make a, a decent cherry melomel from it, but it's a little bit touchy because uh, the acidity is just, I mean, it's just so brightly acidic that it's its very easy to get it way too tart. And uh, the Morello just seems to, um, and it's kind of odd because... For- I, think Chris just, I think Chris just disconnected himself. <laughs> Oops. Let me see if we can get Chris back uh, because I know he wanted to be in. We've actually got Patty Mackey uh, joining us tonight from, I believe it's New Hudson, Michigan. Patty, are you there? 
Oh, hi. Yeah, I'm here now. Hey, hey. hey. Yeah, we, we, I don't know what happened there, Chris. Um, uh, we had a storm uh, blow through. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> all right. So, uh, all right. So, Morello, I mean, if you can find the Morello tart cherry juice, that's the best uh, one to use. If not, I guess the Ma Morrissey will work in a pinch. Um, it will. But, and like what I was, what I was saying before I got cut off, uh, from what I've read, the Morellos actually have more acidity, which is odd because they don't come out nearly as tart. So, uh, that's kind of an interesting thing. I guess it's the kind of acidity they have in them. Yeah. All right. Well, um, Patty Mackey. Are you- Joins Are us, you able uh, to hear me? Oh yeah, we got you good. Uh, from good. Uh, New Hudson, Michigan, I caught up with Patty. Uh, uh, what what Facebook group was it, Patty? I belong to so many of them. Oh, I believe it was on the Mead Group. The Mead Group. Um, yeah, though it could have been the Underground Meadery. I'm on both. I think it was. Uh, I, I think it was the same post that we we uh, were, were talking about Grady Ogle this morning. He was uh, looking to do a boche. Uh, I think yeah. that's the, yeah, that's the one that uh, we got into. And now there are a couple a couple of things uh, that we wanted to talk to you about. One was your boche. I, I love that picture uh, on your Facebook page. Uh, you just recently bottled that, correct? Bottled that one today. Yeah. It was started uh, the 30th of March. 30th of March. So it, is it ready to drink now? Uh, it's a little bit hot. I think some age will improve it, but I'm real happy with the flavor so far. It was just a traditional um, caramelized honey, yeast, water, and nutrients. Yeah. What, what kind? Of- somehow it's, it's picked up an apple flavor that must be coming from the honey. Do you remember what kind of honey it was? Yeah, because this was my first boche, I didn't buy expensive honey. This was five pounds of Meyer brand, which Meyer's is a grocery store here. Okay. Um, didn't even say whether it was clover or, you know, it just was honey. Honey. So I thought if, I, if I'm going to burn honey, I'm going to burn the cheap stuff first. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I uh, the first time that I even caramelized some honey, I, I did it in a small copper clad bottom stainless steel, you know, the kind your grandmother probably had uh, back. Yeah, in the day. I got those for Revere wear. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, and uh, you know, so I thought, well, let, let me see what this does first. So I put a little bit in the in the pan. I started fire up underneath it and. You know, when it was done and over with, I thought, "Oh my God, how can anybody possibly use this in you know in a mead?" <laughs> so, I mean, it was just it just tasted like garbage to me. But you know, I'm talking to Jeff, uh, uh, you know, and, and the guys here, and then of course doing some further reading, I managed to get some uh, 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 some decent caramelized honey. And the one thing that I found. We talked about it on the last show. In fact, if you if you go to episode thirteen, we talked about my discovery, my wild discovery. I did two quarts of mesquite honey and two quarts of wildflower honey in the same batch uh, in the uh, in the pressure canner, and both came out wildly different. Uh, yeah, I did. I did see that from your last show. Yeah, and uh, but I thought I thought maybe you might be able to shed some light on that. But I, I guess if this is your first boche, maybe not, huh? Well, I've done two of them now. Okay. And because the first one took on this really nice apple flavor that I don't know where it's coming from. My intent was to make a coffee boche, but that one tasted so unique, I decided to leave it alone, and I started another batch. Sometimes. And, uh, 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 it's it's pretty amazing how sometimes that works out, doesn't it? I mean, you you taste it and it tastes pretty good all by itself, and you think, "Wow, my old just yeah, it's, phone. it had a unique flavor that I wanted to keep. Yeah. So I started the second batch, and this was inexpensive honey again, Costco clover honey. They both seem to turn out very much the same as far as caramelizing them. I I use a crock pot method. Okay. To me, that's the easiest and safest. It goes so slow that 
I don't feel like I'm going to overcook it or. How long did it take you? Uh, how long did it take you to caramelize the honey in a in a coffee? Uh, I went about three and a half hours on high. That's about right, on huh, Jeff. Yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Yeah, and good yeah. call on doing it on the high setting. <laughs> well, <laughs> and Otherwise again, it's going to be there a long time. Yeah, with the lid a jar so I can let the steam escape, or I'd have been there all day. Exactly. Now, so, when, um, now the second one I ended up making into the coffee boche because that they caramelized nicely, but it didn't have any of those apple undertones that I liked in the first one. So okay. I didn't feel bad about putting this one on the coffee. Now, how much and, coffee? I had, talk, talk to us about your coffee. How, how did you approach that? I just coarsely ground about a half a pound of um, some peace coffee that was meant to make cold brew from. It's a fairly dark roast. Okay. And I racked on top of that in secondary. In secondary. Okay. Yep. You made a good call going with with a half pound. Yeah. And it's very coffee. (laughs) It's, well... You're uh, okay. So you 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 put your cold. Did you, you put the beans and everything in secondary, or just the cold brew, just the liquid? No, I didn't make liquid. I just oh. coarsely ground the beans, put them in the bottom of the secondary, and racked my oh. meat on top of it. Oh, okay. I let the I... mead let the mead do the extraction. Wow. Okay, and you have uh, and it, you, you got a real strong, real good, solid coffee flavor out of that. Yeah, it's Kahlua's got nothing on this. <laughs> wow, guys, mm. it turned uh, out great. Okay, you know, that's that's I, one we're, of the we're, we're interested. We yeah, <laughs> did they, well, and this one's ready to bottle. I just have to find time to do it. Okay, go, go ahead, Aaron. Yeah, did did we toss around an idea about doing that with some of our coffees that we've got going on where we might rack on top of some more beans in secondary? I, I, yeah, I think Sergio mentioned that about uh, doing that for, to get some extra aroma. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah like I like that not too for some more flavor and uh, aroma in secondary just because I felt it was a little weak for the sweetness I made too. I only okay. left it on the coffee for 24 hours. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Oh, wow. Okay. I mean, like, about the same amount of time you would do a cold brew. Oh, how mm-hmm. interesting. Okay. And, and then I uh, racked, racked it again and put it on a vanilla bean. All right, okay. guys. Uh, I might have to cut the show a little short tonight. Seems like I got some caramelizing to do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, 24 hours. Okay, so you're you're basically making a cold brew out of your mead. Exactly. How come we didn't think of that, guys? <laughs> because we're not smart. <laughs> well, I don't know. Hey, I get a lot of good information from this show. Well, I, I think we all have different variations on it. I'd be interested to taste everybody's. Well, that's what we're here for because we're we're not here just to teach. We're here to learn also. Yeah. And uh, I don't care how long you've been doing it, you can still learn something. And when you think you've gotten to the point where you can't, you need to stop making mead. (laughs) True story. Yeah. How interesting. Um, Go ahead, Patty. Well, that's, you know, that's why I listen to these podcasts and do a lot of research. I I belong to a homebrew club, but there's not very many mead makers there for me to learn from. So the Internet's been my source of my main source of of learning. Um, Uh, And there's a local uh, microbrew company that the co-owner there, she's a mead maker. So she's been my mentor for the past four and a half years, so which is that brewing company in South Lyon? So give a shout out to Aaron Cotton Jim who got me started. Absolutely. Uh, yes, uh, Patty Patty emailed us about the cherry uh, cherry melomel project that we had going, and she had mentioned in a in an email uh, to me about 
that she liked the statement from Ken Schramm. Yeah. And so I, I sent her my recipe for that. Yeah. Yeah, and, I could uh, uh, duplicate that. I've got a small yeah, SS Brutech system coming tomorrow. Uh, well, Patty, sure. if you will follow that recipe I sent you, uh, you will come up with something very, very close. Now, that that uh, Morello cherry juice that we were talking about, the fruit fast, um, yes. Make sure you make sure you use that because uh, that's what Ken uh, Ken uses Morellos in his uh, statement reserve, uh, which is supposedly better than the regular statement. Now I haven't I haven't had the reserve, but he uses the uh, Palatons in the regular statement. But they're oh, they're right up there with the Morellos, and I think the Morellos may have an edge on them. So. Uh, follow well, that recipe and give it a try. And I think you'll be happy with it. Getting the fruit fast will be easy for me. I'm in Michigan, and that's where it's made. <laughs> and there's a Kroger right down the street that always has it on the shelf. Oh, you lucky yep. people. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is mead country. <laughs> we have shrimps and bead nectar, yeah. and tuna, and dragon mead. Wow. I'm surrounded by mead. <laughs> well, the recipe that I sent you is that's the one that I make all the time uh, but I didn't post that on the website because there's a lot of people who don't like uh, that much tart cherry uh, so I mm-hmm. scaled it down a little bit but uh, if that's what you're after uh, follow that recipe that I sent you in the email and you won't be disappointed yeah that's what I'm after it was a very bold cherry I like yep. what you're doing with the chocolate. I'll probably try that one at some point, but for this first batch on my new temperature control system, the cherry has been my goal to make for quite a while. So you're gonna yeah, love. Well, get you there. You're gonna you're gonna love that stainless steel uh, fermenter patty. And uh, if you ever, uh, if Michael ever uh, uh, sends you an email or whether, tell him that JD Webb and the twins said how. Okay. Uh, the um, the other thing that we wanted to talk to you about, uh, yeah. we're we're also uh, interested in the seventy one B yeast. Many of us use that as uh, pretty much our go to yeast, uh, for lack of anything else. Uh, many of the of the meads that we make, uh, uh, we use the seventy one B. And Chris, uh, you know, we've been talking about the 71B and how it only, it, you know, for both of us, it only goes so far and, and it quits. And it's usually right around 102, 104 points. Patty's been yeah, able to take it to 125. Yeah, 104 I, I, to 106. Yeah. yeah. I've dropped 120 to 125 with it. Every time I throw more honey in aiming for a semi sweet, it just burns right through it. Wow. Partly because I don't have great temperature control. I'm stuck with the ambient temperatures yeah. or trying to do a swamp cooler. And with Tazna, the Fermate O and the degassing, I'm finding that's just so efficient that it's eating up everything I throw at it. I've had to go yeah. above 1140 to leave any residual. Wow. Wow. Hey, that just uses a lot of honey. <laughs> you're, you're getting into Mississippi Chris territory there. He likes to start that stuff really high, too. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm wow. getting 18, 18, 19% meads. <laughs> wow. I'm coming to your house next yeah. time we part. <laughs> yeah, you, you shouldn't be getting that with uh, with 71B. However, I will say that, that I have had two batches that have gone crazy on me. For no apparent reason, and I still to this day don't know why they did it. Uh, I had a ginger mead that actually went to 19% with 71B, uh, and I never found a reason why it happened. Uh, I remade it, and the same thing happened again. But I've Hmm. made it a dozen other times that it didn't happen. Uh, So when, when Patty brought that up, I gave her three reasons that I could think of off the top of my head. So for anyone who's had that problem before, let me, let me just share this with you. Uh, of course, what, what she's already said, temperature, if your temperatures are too warm, uh, that will cause any yeast to overshoot its tolerance. 
the second thing is stirring too often. Uh, I always recommend with 71B that you degas twice a day for seven days and no more. Uh, some people get worried when uh, fermentation starts to get further along and it starts to slow down, they think something's wrong, so they start stirring it more, and that will cause a yeast to overshoot its tolerance. Uh, and the third thing uh, is an infection. Uh, and this may not be necessarily a bad infection. Uh, it could be another yeast that you used with that same equipment that has a higher tolerance. Uh, but if, uh, you know, you, you may think that you're being very meticulous with your sanitation, but if your fermentation buckets have got, uh, the tiniest little scratch or anything on any of your equipment, they can harbor that yeast. And, and some of those yeasts are very hardy. They can survive lots of things. Um, and if you've been using the same sanitizer for a long time, they can build up a tolerance to it. Wow. So, um, so I always, you know, that's that's when when I see a yeast starting to overshoot its tolerance, and I I know that all the other stuff is correct. I automatically think infection because, hey, if you've used anything with a higher alcohol tolerance or or anything that has the ability to uh, to mutate very easily. Um, just, uh, you know, it only takes one yeast cell and you've got an infection. And mm -hmm. 71B is very susceptible to the kill factor. So especially if, if it's a yeast with a kill factor, it'll overpower the 71B. Well, I only ferment in glass, no plastic. And mm -hmm. I do alternate between star sand and idafor. Mm, good practice. Uh, I've mm -hmm. never used bleach. But, so I, you know, I think my sanitation practices are good, but I have brewed with K1 V1116, which would, which would have that. That would count for it. Yeah. 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 But, uh, I, I feel like my problem is the temperature issue more than anything. Cause I do have several different fermenters and, not that everything is totally segregated, but I do switch back and forth between sanitizers. Um, yeah. I guess yeah. I guess my new temperature controlled uh, system will tell me where my issue is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah once it, you get that uh, set up, you keep that thing down around sixty two, sixty four degrees, and if you're still overshooting, uh, then you know you need to be looking somewhere else. Right. Well, this would be a yeah. clean vessel, never been brewed in before, too. So, yeah. mm -hmm. um, I can isolate well, it, any previous strains that have been through here. Yeah, because yeah. I, I do well, beers could be in your least could be in your least stir or um, anything that comes in contact with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Well, uh, Patty, thanks for joining us on the show here tonight. You're you're welcome to stick around if you want. Uh, we've got a couple of more things that we want to talk about, uh, and one of them just happens to be, uh, you know, meat making standards and how how they have changed over the years, and uh, some of the information that we find out there on the internet, like you know, a lot of I mean, that's where I found everything I know about meat was out there on the internet. The first recipes that I came across, uh, you know, looked pleasing to me. And what the heck, I didn't know any different. So I started making this stuff. Well, lo and behold, um, you know, there's some there, there's some things, some some additives, some ingredients that people are using that you know, maybe you shouldn't really use. Well, bread yeast, I'm sorry, it just doesn't make decent mead. <laughs> so. Um, so if you want to stick around, you're you're more than welcome uh, oh, to hang out. I'll with probably us. go back to just listening in. Okay. But thank you. thanks for having me on tonight, and uh, I'll listen yeah. to the rest of the episode. Ab absolutely. Thank you again, Patty. Night, and thanks for your help. You bet. Patty Mackey uh, joining us on the show tonight. Uh, gosh. Um, you know, we'll have to get her back on after she gets, uh, you know, one or two done in her new system and find out, uh, you know, if the cooling system, you know, is going to have an effect on 
that 71B. Um, I'm really interested in hearing about that, you know. Um, but um, I thought uh, actually Jeff came up with a pretty good idea um, about this next segment. And, uh, you know, there's, there's so much information out there that, uh, you know, people can get hung up on, on, on this stuff and, you know, they'll go out and spend a lot of money on some, some good honey and, you know, they'll put it all in their fermenter and get it started and it's going to turn out and, you know, it, it's not going to be what they expected. And, I, you know, I mean, let's start out with Jeff. I mean, uh, throw it across the table. Uh, you know, how have standards changed over the years? Oh, man. Um, well, you know, the the thing I would say about it is that it's not so much even that standards have changed. It's that uh, the, the home hobby has become a little bit more science friendly and it's been a little bit more um, – a level of exactness has come over the industry, the home industry, if you will. Um, because we have, if you look at a lot of the older recipes that you find online, a lot of the, um, the, the ones that use a, the more, um, I don't want to say old fashioned, but the, the, the less recent techniques or the less recent advances in making mead, uh, you see a lot of the same things. You see a lot of kind of, um, ball parking and uh, just throw stuff in the fermenter and forget it. And um, a little bit less, you know, precision and a little bit more of a carefree attitude towards putting it together. And I'm not saying that meat has to be an exact science. I'm not saying meat has to be arduous and, you know, take a lot of concentration, but you know, if you want to get a consistent mead, you know, you need to be able to measure things consistently and make sure you're doing a consistent process. Um, And, figuring out ways to get that consistency is, is one of the advances this, this hobby has had in recent years. And it's gotten, you know, much better, I think. Yeah. I know, I know for me, I mean, you know, I, I'm a, I think I'm a pretty darn good cook. I do all the cooking in my house and I rarely use measuring devices. I just mm-hmm. know how much, I know how much the palm of my hand holds. I know how much flour both hands hold when they're cupped together. Uh, so, I, you know, I had to dust off the measuring cups and stuff, to, you know, when I got started in this mead making stuff, you know, because then it was, you know, three cups of this, two cups of that, or, you know, a half a teaspoon of that, a teaspoon of that. Uh, and that's pretty much how they go. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think when you're talking about standards, I, th- I think you br- I think you brought up a good point, and that's measurement. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, measuring is probably I, I don't know, Chris. Uh, you know, you I know you've harped on on you know having a, a gram uh, scale uh, or at least uh, some kind of a small scale. That's, that's almost a must have, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. If you're gonna if you're gonna follow nutrient uh, regimens uh, and do them correctly, um, I mean, how easy is it to get you know uh, uh, an eight ten dollar gram scale off Amazon and and be able to uh, treat your yeast correctly rather than end up with some sort of off flavors because you put way too much nutrients or because you didn't put enough? Yeah. Yeah, uh, and sometimes sometimes the teaspoons uh, just don't cut it. Uh, you know, uh, I've 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 come to measuring everything with my gram scale. I've, I've got a little plastic, a uh, little small, little tiny plastic cup that uh, that I put my my you know uh, nutrients and whatever I'm measuring in. Uh, you know, and uh, the only thing I, I don't even use my teaspoon set anymore for anything. To be honest with you, uh, you know, I use the back of a spoon to dig out how much you know nutrient that I'm going to use. So, so that's one aspect of of standards that you know you, you really need to think about, right? Oh, absolutely. Um, and there's standards. There's some protocol. Um, 
a lot of the, the older recipes that I see also involve things like, well, basically everything gets thrown in at once. Um, there's no, uh, the staggered nutrient protocol like you would see in a modern recipe. Um, they, they really don't specify things like what kind of nutrient to use, how much to use. If they do, it is, again, it's back into like quarters of a teaspoon, um, yeah. measurements. Um, things like, citric acid, um, or acid blend or tannins. Um, they'll give you directions to add that right at the start as well, because you know, the, the recipe that they have been using for years and years, you know, they, they use that much and it usually comes out. Okay. Yeah. Um, really, you no know, uh, common good practice says that we should really wait until, you know, we're out of secondary and we're ready to really dial in that flavor, that finished flavor before we start really tinkering with, you know, things like acid blend. Yeah. And I, you know, I could take, uh, well, Chris is well aware, um, you know, of a, uh, project that I was working on and, you know, I didn't know anything about pH. Uh, my mentor said, you know, you need to get a little pH meter. Fine. I got that. And I would email him the daily readings, uh, and he could see that the pH was getting a little out of whack. And so I was instructed to add, uh, you know, different combinations of tartaric, malic, and, and add, you know, these different acids, uh, it, you know, to the tune of, I think in the end, it, it amounted to like 28 grams in, in this five-gallon batch. And, I, you know, I didn't know any different, you know. Uh, but then when I started tasting this, uh, you know, my mead, I thought, holy cow. I mean, it tasted like the inside of a lead pipe. And I thought, okay, well, maybe maybe this is going to calm down. You know, I mean, it's got to. I mean, it can't last. This can't last forever. Well, it, it seemed like it just kept getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And nothing was going to help it. Absolutely nothing. And here I'm thinking, you know, all my, my pH numbers were in line. Uh, and, you know, everything was coming together. My, my gravity, I mean, everything was coming together nice, you know. And yet this acid thing just, I mean, just blew it out of the water. I mean, it just totally ruined a five-gallon, you know, and, and we're talking, you know, probably about $80 worth of honey on top of it, you know, plus the other ingredients. So, I mean, you know, so, yeah, the acid blend is one thing. And, I, and you know, if, when you buy this acid blend, uh, uh, if you look at the at the label on it, I mean, it it's about – it's about 80% citric acid. And yeah, and that's, that's another bad thing that people need to, need to understand. In addition to the fact that these are all things you add after the fact, uh, the kind of acid that you add makes a world of difference as well. That's something that we haven't really talked about on the show, uh, and we need to get into that. Um, as to what what these different kinds of acid will do to certain kinds of mead, um, you, you know, you don't want to take something that's uh, got citrus fruit in it, for example, and go adding malic acid. It's going to clash with it. Yeah. Uh, that's a that's a citric acid flavor. It's a citric acid fruit, and that's what you need to use to enhance it. Uh, on the other hand, if you've got your tart cherry that you're working with or black currant, well, not black currant so much, but the tart cherry, uh, cherries get their acidity from malic acid. So if you go adding tartaric or citric to that, well, you know, you may end up with something weird tasting. So, um, don't if you're going to buy acid, don't buy a blend. Buy individual acids so that you can tailor your acid additions later on, if need be, uh, to what they should be to match the fruit or the whatever you're making. Yeah. Well, Aaron, what what about you know when you see these recipes out there on online, and, and there are very few places where you can go and find you know, bona fide recipes where people have actually made with some degree of success that, you know, actually has, you know, add three grams of nutrient or, 
you know, what have you. But I mean, how do you, you find something that looks pretty decent. How do you go about converting or, uh, you know, how, how, how would you convert something that you find online into something you could actually make? You know, that's a really good question. I, I think, um, I, I would, if it were me personally, I would probably cross reference what I'm finding online with, you know, a, a resource that I fully trust and, you know, have had better success with and then see if, you know, kind of compare the two methods and see if there are aspects of the the recipe from the trusted source that um, are, are missing from, from the other recipe. And if so, kind of tailor the, the other recipe towards that. So, um, you know, for example, I, I think we, we've all touched on the, the Mead Made Right website um, and, and the Tasna protocol. I, I think that, that definitely seems to be a, a methodology that's working very well for a lot of people. Um, and, and just some of the, the instructions and aspects of that methodology, I think, can be adapted to, to other recipes that may not call for that, whether or not it's, you know, the, just the things we've been talking about, the staggered nutrients, the degassing, um, and, you know, the, the different things like that try to incorporate those into the recipe that you find online. And, and, you know, just one other thought I'm having is if, if you find a recipe online that, you know, maybe the ingredients or the, the flavors that, that you're finding look good, but some of those other, you know, key elements are, are lacking there. You may be onto something, but if you follow it step by step for what's out there, you you may be less than pleased when when the results are in. Um, so, is there yeah. uh, Jeff? When you go around looking at some of these recipes, uh, and you know, I think we mentioned a couple of websites. Uh, you know, last time we talked about this, uh, you know, you find these recipes out there. I mean, is there anything that really sticks out like a sore thumb at you? Something just kind of kind of draws your attention in these recipes. <laughs> uh, as far as like, good things, like or everything. As far as bad things? <laughs> yeah. Well, any, yeah. I mean, anything. I mean, you know, we're talking about the total result here. So, I mean, uh, from primary to secondary, uh, and, you know, and a lot of times you don't even see anything about anything about racking into a secondary. You know, you see the basic recipe. You're instructed to put the honey in the water, mix it all up, put your yeast in, you know, put a sock over the top or an airlock or whatever, you know, whatever it calls for. And then, you know, in six months, you're going to have some mead. Yep. And that's not necessarily how it works, is it? Oh, no, no, of course not. I mean, not if, not if you want to get the, you know, and here's the thing. Uh, I, here's, I think, why this is important. When we've touched on this a number of times in the show, honey isn't cheap. Yeah. Um, and we've, all of us have had the batch that didn't turn out as well as we wanted it to. Most all of us have had the batch that just, you know, would have been better down the drain than, uh, in somebody's glass. Um, I, I have not thrown out many batches of mead, but I have plenty of glasses of mead, or I have been, plenty of batches of mead that, um, I save for myself and I don't serve to guests. Um, <laughs> yeah. you know, they, uh, we, the goal here is to get the best possible that you can get. And there are some recipes out there. Um, for example, I actually found one um, to use as a, a kind of an example here. Um, that uh, they sound like they'd be a really interesting mead. So um, this one is, this is actually from a, a Game of Thrones uh, themed website. Um, and it is, where is it? Here we go. It's uh, Marjorie's Wild Rose Mead. Uh, for anybody that follows the show, Marjorie's house symbol is a, a rose. So it's kind of apropos. And with my, my previous experience with, uh, with hibiscus and chamomile, this kind of floral, um, floral mead sounded interesting here. So the recipe here calls for two pounds of honey, a pint of fresh fragrant rose petals, a quarter teaspoon of citric acid, a quarter teaspoon of grape tannin, um, one teaspoon of yeast nutrient, champagne yeast and a handful of chopped cherries optional for color um 
<laughs> okay. The first instruction in this in this recipe is to boil half a gallon of water and the honey for twenty minutes. Um, I would absolutely not do that. Um, that's if you've got a good honey and you've got some good floral and or you know, even honey aromatics to it. Um, boiling is going to get rid of those. I would absolutely. Uh, and that's uh, it, it, it's been fairly recent. Uh, I mean, fairly recent. I'm going to say maybe what the last five years or so that they've discovered that boiling honey really has a dire effect on on the aroma and flavor and everything. Well, and no. this is where this is where the different books kind of treat this differently. I mean, Ken Schramm's book is a little bit older than C. Piazza's book, and uh, it. It basically treats boiling as optional, whereas I think Steve Piazza's book, being a little bit more recent, um, generally says the preference is not to boil. Yeah, I could be wrong in this. It's been a while since I've read either of them, but I believe you know as we as we uh, refine our craft, we're, we're realizing boiling is really just not the good way to do it. Um, and I wonder, I wonder how much of that is a carryover from beer brewers who who thought that. Well, you've got to do that to sanitize it. Or winemaking, too. You know? Yeah. Yeah, either or. I'm sure this is a, you know, the the fact that honey has its own um, antimicrobial or antibacterial properties was probably not considered um, initially when people were, you know, making mead and using beer or wine making techniques they they kind of just said oh well we do this for wine we do this for beer we need to do this for mead um the rules don't necessarily apply we can we can assume just based on the uh the thickness and the the lack of moisture in the honey that it's actually pretty sterile going in uh without any special treatment or anything like that um now to this recipe's credit this also treats that as optional the next Sentences. Alternatively, just put a half a gallon of water and uh, honey straight into the bucket without boiling it. Yeah. The next step is to add all the ingredients except the yeast. Um, when the water cools to lukewarm, or oh, right away if you're skipping boiling, add the other half gallon of water and sprinkle the yeast on top. Sprinkle the uh, yeast on top. Sprinkle the dry yeast on top. Yep. Did it call uh, out a specific type of yeast? Champagne yeast. Sh- champagne. champagne yeast. That runs the gamut, doesn't it? <laughs> There's, there are a few champagne yeasts, and yeah. you know, I, I'm not even sure I would choose champagne yeast for a floral bead, but um, no, I think uh, I think I would definitely nail down a specific yeast you want to use, and you know, Lavalin websites, um, the homebrew store websites. Uh, there are great resources out there for finding, you know, the particular yeast you want to use for any given ferment or any given characteristics you want to draw out of the ingredients, of the honey. Um, it, it's a little bit of research. That's all it takes. Yeah. Um, I would also definitely, you know, follow the uh, the rehydration protocols that are, um, you know, that are pretty standard these days. Use some go firm. Um, MeadMadeRight.com has has a perfect one for Tosna um, that I've used really successfully in a bunch of batches, even when I wasn't following Tosna specifically. Um, I would highly recommend it to anybody that's starting out just to use a, use that to make a starter. Um, and then, you know, in addition to just making a starter, absolutely temper that mead into the uh, or sorry, temper the must into that starter, uh, so you've got a good volume of a starter uh, when you finally pitch it into your you must. And there's um, a reason for there, there's a reason for that. There, I mean, there's a specific reason for that, right? I mean, other than just sprinkle the yeast on. I mean, because you can. I mean, sure. there's nothing that says you can't just you know sprinkle the dry yeast on top of the must. But there's another reason why you sh- you should really rehydrate it, right? Yeah, absolutely. You you're going to get the yeast started out correctly. Um, it's going to be less stressful for the yeast and. Honestly, the stagger nutrient protocol, um, which is another thing we need to bring up here, because when they say add all the ingredients, they're also talking about adding the teaspoon of yeast nutrient. Mm-hmm. Um, the stagger nutrient protocol is ultimately about making this as non-stressful as possible for the yeast to let the yeast do as smooth and clean of a ferment as possible, um, and you know, like 
like we said last week, and I'm pretty sure a few times before, um, we don't necessarily want a fast ferment. We want a nice, slow, easygoing ferment. We want things to take their their time, get things done properly, and uh, that will yield the best tasting mead because it will have the least like off flavors, fusel alcohols, and things like that that have come along for the ride. Yeah. Yeah, and if I can get just just for briefly, if I can get really nerdy again here about yeah. the rehydration, uh, using the go firm, you're you're providing nutrients, you're providing vitamins and minerals, and you're providing um, some um, branch chain amino acids and different things for the yeast. Um, this is all things that the yeast are going to use to strengthen their cell wall, and it's it's this. Uh, wall around the cell that's going to protect that yeast when it goes into the must. And uh, it's going to be selectively permeable to sugar, uh, to the alcohol coming out, and uh, to everything in its environment, for that matter. Uh, the stronger that cell wall is, uh, the, the better the yeast are protected, and the better they'll be able to do their job without being stressed and uh, without um, producing off flavors and, and bad aromas and things because that's that's when the yeast start to produce these things is when, uh, when they start to get stressed. So if you're getting off flavors, if you're getting higher alcohols, bad aromas, uh, your yeast are stressed in some form or fashion. Uh, now for about the one millionth and... 200th time, I'll say uh, another reason I like 71B is because it is so uh, it's so tolerant of these things. Uh, even without rehydration nutrients like GoFirm, it can handle a lot of abuse. But uh, when you start making higher gravity needs like I make that start in 1140 plus all the way up to 1162, um, and you rehydrate with GoFirm, the 71B will will go right in there and, and handle that perfectly because you've strengthened that cell wall. And that holds true for any yeast. It will, uh, it will perform better in its own environment uh, when, when it's at its healthiest. Uh, so it's no different than giving a, a ball player some, uh, uh, you know, some amino acids and a multivitamin and, and he's uh, strong and healthy before he goes out on the field. Sometimes I wonder if Chris actually talks to his yeast. <laughs> I have I have said a few words in passing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, like, you know, when you put the go for a minute, it's like, okay, boys, come on to the dinner table. I got you some prime rib with a baked potato, sour cream chives, a green salad. With some Caesar dressing and some croutons. <laughs> that ain't what we eat in Mississippi. Good grief. Well, well god dang. Uh, collard oh. greens and pork chops, maybe. <laughs> come on, you should come get your pork chop dinner. And a little cornbread. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, you got to treat yeah, your yeast it. like pets. You, you know, you're wanting, you're asking these yeast to, to do something good for you, so well, yeah. you got to treat them good. Yeah, for me, you know, on my house, it's usually, you know, I have to bribe them, but uh, what the heck. Yeah. So, uh, so what else did you find on that recipe, Jeff, that, that may be troublesome? Well, then here's another telling part of the recipe to me. I mean, after you, uh, after you add the yeast, they ask you to cover the, um, let's see, yeah, cover the bucket with uh, cheesecloth, ferment that for 10 days, and that's all well and good. Um, then you siphon that off into, um, a, uh, uh, another bucket or a, whatever you're, you're using to ferment with, um, to strain off the flowers and let that sit for 60 days. Um, they recommend then you rack that to a different bucket. Um, but that's it for another 60 days. And then after that, you can bottle it and let it age for a year. And it seems like an awful lot of aging. Um, so I think, uh, I, I think it's a little bit telling that they're recommending right up front that you're going to, you're going to need to sit on this for about a year and a half before it's drinkable. Um, I think with good practices, we could probably cut that down quite a bit. 
Well, and you I mean, didn't even mention the fact that they're adding acids and tannins right up front either. This is correct. Yeah, that, that all, all got added right up front. Yeah, yeah, and you know, even in winemaking, so much of that is actually added in the back, uh, you know, on the back end of things. But um, acid, acid, and tannins are like pictures on the wall. You know, if you build a new house, uh, you get the house painted and you get moved in, and then you decide what grapes you want and what pictures you want and where you want to hang them to make the room look nice. And that's how you approach acids and tannins. There, you taste it after it's finished, and then you decide if it needs it. Mississippi Chris going to tell us a bedtime story about his yeast and the house they live in. <laughs> I'm going to resign. <laughs> oh, you can't. <laughs> no, it's, uh, I mean, you're so right. I mean, you, you know, I mean, you're so right. Uh, you know, so, uh, but go on, move, moving on, Jeff. <laughs> well, that's about it for this recipe, really. And I think, yeah. uh, you know, Chris is right. We ended the, the, uh, fermentation stage. That's when we want to dial it in with the tannins and, uh, the acids and things like that, where we kind of want to do anything we need to do as far as fine tuning the flavor. Um, this is also another time you can do things like, uh, instead of doing tannins, you could oak it. Uh, I don't know how that would fly with flour, more uh, flavors and aromas, but you could do something like that. Uh, you could sit it on some vanilla. Um, that might actually be pretty good. Um, and, geez, we could fine it to uh, to speed up some of this racking process, too. We could throw some super clear KC in there, uh, gelatin, um you know, there's a bunch of different finding agents that would probably speed up this process too. And no mention of any kind of temperature control or anything while it's fermenting, right? Oh no, we're we're putting it in the bucket. So yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, you know, and I, I I found lots and lots and lots of recipes out there just like that. And mm-hmm. uh, you know, and, I, and like I said, when I first started out, I mean, uh, you look at these websites, and yeah, I mean, there's one in particular. I don't want to mention the name. Uh, but, I mean, it looked like the guy knew what he's talking about. I mean, they're just loaded with recipes and information about making meat. So I thought, wow, this, this guy really knows his stuff. Well, <laughs> he, he, I, I guess it might have worked back then. And, yeah, if you want to wait three years for your meat, I guess that's okay. But in the meantime, uh, you know, some of it just doesn't work anymore. Uh and I, you know, and I think a lot of it has to do with the day and age that we live in too. I mean, we we seem to be in a bigger hurry to to accomplish things, and we want our wines and our meads and our beers and everything to finish sooner than uh, you, you know than later. Uh, you know, there there sometimes I, I don't know if it's so much as a rush. Maybe that's the wrong word to want to speed things along so that we can get it in our glass. And to be able to drink it all, and then when it's gone, go make another batch. And uh, uh, but Aaron, uh, chime in here, bud. Uh, you know, as I'm just I'm sitting here listening, and I'm thinking of my own experiences and just kind of this progression that we've seen in terms of better practices coming to the forefront in mead making. I mean, when I first started getting into home brewing. You know, back 2008, 2009 time frame, I remember going to the, the local homebrew supply shop after reading the mead chapter in, in Charlie Papazian's The Joy of Home Brewing book, really excited about it and, and wanting to delve into it. It sounded like a really interesting, delicious beverage that, that I wanted to make. And I remember the, the guy, the owner, discouraging me from making it. He's like, Oh, you don't want to make that stuff. It's, you know, it takes too much time and it it doesn't turn out very good and this and that. And like, I, I just came out of that conversation completely disenchanted with the idea of making mead, uh, you know, fast forward a couple of years to when I moved up to, to Wisconsin, um, you know, I, I remember going and, um, during the, the grand opening festival, or the grand opening of this, this local homebrew supply shop up here. Um, 
they actually had Kurt Stock come in and, and teach a, a mead making course, which, you know, when you're there in person without your, your notes and notebook to, to record everything that he's doing, I, I'm sure I was only able to absorb so much. And, and there were critical details that, that I forgot. So, so at that point in time, I'm going completely off of the instruction pamphlet from the, the homebrew supply shop. And, uh, you know, looking at that, there's just several key instructions that were missing there. You know, I think number one, one of the, the big pitfalls I see with, with recipes is just completely going off of the, the number of pounds of honey to you. So, you know, if you want to do a dry mead, go with 12 pounds of honey for a five gallon batch. If you want to, you know, semi sweet, go with 15. And if you want to sweet, go with 18. And that can just yield extremely variable results. Yeah. Um, I, I think, you know, get yourself a, a hydrometer that that's the mead maker's best friend. Um, you know, the, the recipe didn't even touch on degassing or, or anything like that. So, um, you know, nowadays, you know, we've, we've talked about Ken Tram's book and the, the mead made right.com. And, and it just seems like, like over the last six or seven years from what I've seen, we've gone from, you know, kind of steering people away from making mead because it, I, I think the, the process just wasn't very well understood back then to a point now where there's just, you know, or the process good, was so vague. Yeah. Yeah. It was vague and not explicitly called out. And now those, those steps and the good practices are out there. They're readily available. And, and it just seems like more people know the, the right things to do these days. Yeah. Well, I mean, I recall when I first started, uh, you know, making mead, when I first discovered, I thought, you know, geez, all this is is honey, water, and yeast. I can do that. Nothing to it, <laughs> you know. Yep. Uh, yeah, it's a different ball game. I mean, you know, it took me a while, but I learned. Uh, and, yeah, the hydrometer, I actually have two of them uh, just in case I break one. Uh, you know, I don't even weigh my honey anymore. I just, I know how much is how much to get to about where I want to get. Uh, and I pour it in and, you know, when I get close, that's when the hydrometer goes in. And I start taking readings and, you know, add the honey, the water, the honey, the water until I get to a point where uh, it's at where I want it to be. You know? Absolutely. Uh, I right. found, you know, some one of the strangest places... You know, and I, I was doing some research for this show, Jeff, and one of the strangest, you're not going to believe this, one of the strangest places that I found a mead recipe is actually on the Popular Mechanics website. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, published uh, in 2013. Uh, the link. The actual is, Grace Boucher? Nope. This is uh, this is just a plain old honey, just a traditional uh, that's mentioned in this article. Uh, I mean, you know, the, the procedures and everything are, are pretty current. I mean, it, you know, it was published in 2013, like I said. But I, I just thought, you know, when I'm googling, you know, looking for mead recipes to talk about on the show and whatnot, this popped up. And I thought, nah, I got to put this in the show notes. I, I, I don't believe this. <laughs> you know, popular mechanics. So go figure. Of well, all places. It's, it's funny yeah. you mentioned that, actually. Um, I was uh, I was watching, you know, my Facebook feed one day as, as I'm wont to do. And um, I happened to follow the, the Facebook of one of my favorite shows, which is Ask This Old House on PBS. Um, just it it's right up my alley as far as, you know, people will write in and say, Hey, my, uh, my washing machines on the fritz, how do I fix this? My, uh, this, that, or the other needs replaced around the house. I mean, it's, it's good stuff to sink my teeth into, but apparently next season they are going to be at the, I think it's the 1654 metery, uh, learning how to brew some mead. Oh, wow. Yeah. That'll be an interesting episode to catch. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Well, I don't know, uh, you know, I mean, I'm sure we could probably talk for the next couple of shows about this old, this old mead making experience and, you know, how the standards and everything have changed uh, over, over time. Well, what's the best, 
you know, what, what's the best advice we can give people out there who are learning to make mead for the first time, or, or maybe researching it uh, with an interest in making mead? You know, and they and they find these uh, uh, places out there on the internet. You know, what can well, we tell from them? downloading our back catalog? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I would say, you know, if you find a recipe you like, um, that that is a wonderful thing. I mean, the, like I said, this, oops. This uh um this rose mead sounds great. It sounds like right up my alley, something I would totally make on my own. Um the uh the, the thing is to just, you know, do some research and kind of uh, look at modern practices, look at other practices, look at the way thing, people are doing things um, and see if you can't make that recipe better. Uh, yeah. Just because somebody has published a recipe doesn't mean it's the, the end-all, be-all way to do that particular recipe. There is always room for improvement. I mean, we have my, uh, my hibiscus and chamomile award-winning mead recipe up on the website. Yeah. Um, and I... I fully intend to continue tweaking that and improving on it as I go um, because, hey, it's great right now, but I have no idea if I couldn't make it better. Um, it's it's just the attitude you have to take with this is that there are always ways we can make things a little bit better, a little bit better every time. Yeah. And you have to be open-minded about it and willing to, you know, to look at your options and look at uh, – how things have improved and see if you can't use that to improve the recipe yourself. Yeah. You know, and I, feel, I, I guess if I were to put it in a nutshell, if you run across a recipe like we were talking about here tonight, you know, it says tannins and acids and, and what have you. Uh, you know, if you like the recipe, leave the tannins and acids out. Go ahead and make it as it's written. Uh, but don't forget some of the uh, some of the other standards that we were talking about. You know, use precise measuring uh, equipment. Uh, you know, to to measure. Uh, you know, go see the the Mead Made Right website. Get involved with that Tosma because it it absolutely works. And uh, Sergio, uh, there's a, like a version two, uh, like a 2.0 uh, up there now. So there, it covers both Fermade O and Fermade K. Um, you know, uh, and, and go ahead and make that recipe, you know. Uh, you know, think about temperature control. That's the number one killer right there. Uh, if you want to, you know, if, if you if you don't want to drink your mead for three years, then don't worry about it. But if you want to drink your mead in the next, you know, few months, then you, you really need to get it, uh, you know, get your temperatures under, under control. Patty uh, learned that lesson. I mean, she got, uh, I guess, you know, tonight she says that she's got uh, that uh, little brew. Uh, uh, it's a little brew, a little three-gallon brew master they came out with last year. Uh, perfect for small batches. And they, and they just this year they came out with the cooling system for it at uh, SS Brew Tech. So, you know, I mean, it might have been through lessons that she's learned and, uh, you know, discovered this is the best way to, to do things. That's how you find out. That's how you learn, you know. So and hey, you, let's let's also mention one more thing you need to do when you're brewing. Every time, take really good notes as to what you did. Because um, yeah. if you deviate from a recipe at all, whether it's improving it like we're talking about tonight um, or maybe using a different honey or a different – um, a different ingredient source. Make notes about that because you're not going to be able to replicate unless you know what you did differently. Yeah, um, exactly. And as you improve, you know, you can add that recipe to the the amount of recipes that are floating around the websites and uh, Facebook and things like that. And not only will you have a better recipe up there than um, some of these old ones that keep getting circulated around, but then we'll be able to improve on it even more. Yeah. Yeah. What, uh, Aaron, uh, do you have a max amount that you'll pay for honey? It's a good question. I, <laughs> I have to say I do actually. Um, so going back to this honey varietal experiment that I have, uh, have been working on here the, the last several months, um, went to, uh, this, this local honey shop and, you know, they've got all, all different kinds of, of honey, you know, the, the blueberry, cranberry, raspberry blossoms, um, the sunflower, 
one of the varietals that I was really interested in and, and actually was initially intending on using is Tupelo. Um, so all of their honeys are $5.25 per pound, except for Tupelo, which is more than twice that. They're charging $12 a pound. Um, so, I mean, you know, for three or four pounds, I mean, we're talking 35, 40 plus bucks for a one gallon batch. Yeah. Does it come on a gold plated bucket? Uh, Yeah. Right. (laughs) So, so that was, that was a maximum amount for me. I I decided not to use that variety. (laughs) Randy, uh, Randy Mitchell, uh, I I caught up with this over on the mead maker Facebook group. Randy Mitchell was asking a question. What's the average price per pound uh, that people were paying uh, in their area? And they actually had quite a few replies. Virginia, uh, Cody Ritchie uh, from Virginia pays anywhere from 3 to $7, depending upon the amount and the type of honey, well, type meaning the, the variety. Uh, Jonathan Hansen, I don't know where he lives, uh, pays anywhere from 2 to $5 at Costco to $9 from local beekeepers. Uh, Randy happens to live in Texas, uh, and he says people down there charge up to ten dollars a pound for it. Uh, Tennessee, this is kind of over in Chris's neck of the woods. Chuck Mangiovi uh, says he pays three dollars when buying by the uh, by the gallon, and uh, I think what he meant to say was, uh, well, the post says. Uh, $3 when he buys by the gallon or six-gallon pail. I think he meant to say the 60-pound uh, uh, pail, which is a, a five-gallon bucket. Art Smith, uh, he lives in Colorado. Uh, he says he just found a gallon for 50 bucks. Uh, that 50 bucks seems to be the going price for the typical clovers, orange blossoms, that kind of thing. North Carolina, Matt Williams. Uh, he says he can get clover honey for about $2.50 a pound. Uh, he goes to a local restaurant supply store and gets it. Uh, and I got a question about that here in a minute. He gets orange blossom uh, anywhere from 4 to $5 a pound. Tim Hawley, uh, he lives in New York. Uh, he sells honey, and they get $6 a pound. Uh, but all around them, he says it goes for 7 to $8 a pound. Uh, down in Mexico, uh, Hector Rafael Molinado uh, in Mexico, he gets it by the kilo. He says it's uh, two pounds for five dollars. It's local and it's raw. Michael O'Connell, uh, he said he I don't know where he lives either, but he says he pays four dollars for wildflower. That's a pound. Mississippi. This is down in Chris's neck of the woods. In fact, this comes from Chris Monroe. Says he pays anywhere from four to five dollars a pound. Of course, California. JD Webb. He gets 160 bucks for 60 pound bucket of wildflower. It's raw, or I can go to uh, like Bennett's Honey Farm up the road from me, and it's typically 50, 55 bucks for a one gallon bucket. 240 dollars for a five gallon pail of the Orange blossom wildflower. If you want anything like blueberry or whatever, it's almost twice that. So, I, you know, uh, the honey prices across the country seem to be pretty, you know, they're within a couple bucks of each other. You know? Yeah, as you're reading through that, it seems like, I don't know, maybe 80%. Of of what you were just reading is what maybe between three to seven dollars per pound. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. yeah. And uh, I mean, Chris, do you do you have a max amount of uh, of money that you'll spend on honey before you just say, you know what, I'm going to start making beer instead? <laughs> oh, I suppose at some point I might reach that that point. I don't know. Um, 
you know, I, I just pay uh, whatever I uh, whatever I have to pay now to get good honey. Now, you know? Listen to that Australian <laughs> crap coming out of Mississippi, Chris. <laughs> Who is this guy, and what have you done yeah. with Mississippi, Chris? <laughs> yeah. oh, listen, I, I don't know that bloke. I, 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 I'm a crocodile, Chris. You know. Um, oh my God. Uh, <laughs> well, Jane, he didn't want me eating collard greens and cornbread, so I thought I'd. Yeah. Uh, and this, yeah, this is the guy that eats raw eggs for breakfast in the morning. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> seriously, it's, uh, you know, I would say probably like for wildflower, uh, good wildflower, uh, in from Tennessee or somewhere is like 350, uh, a pound, something like that. But, you know, if I'm going to put a lot of money into a recipe and, and do other ingredients and, and get the best I can get, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to try to save, uh, a few bucks by getting a cheaper honey. I, I would rather, you know, I, I'd rather wait and, and get the good stuff because some things, you know, the honey can really make or break it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and, and going back to the Tupelo that was 12 bucks a pound, I mean, yeah, that sounds absurd, but that is supposed to be just some phenomenal honey. And, and up in my neck of the woods, you just can't find it anywhere else. So, you know, one, one of these days I may splurge on, on a one gallon batch that to, to just give it a try. Um, so, so to your point, Chris, like, you know, honey is just inherently expensive and, if you're going through the the trouble and, and taking the time to put a batch together, splurging on on the best possible ingredients that you can find is not a bad way to go. Yeah, and this whole meat making thing is based around patience. And so, hey, if you're short of money and you don't have enough to get the honey that you that you want, uh, wait a while, save up for it. Uh, you'll be glad you did. But, you know, you didn't. You didn't settle for the cheap stuff. Jeff, have you got a, uh, of course, I mean, Jeff is going to be making his own here uh, very shortly, but do you have a, uh, do you have a max? I mean, is there a line in the sand where you just absolutely refuse to pay? Oh, man, there's no line in the sand. Um, I do freely admit that I'm kind of a cheap bastard. Uh, <laughs> I I really don't want to spend money um, on on honey, it's not that I don't want to spend money on on good honey. I want to spend money on good honey. The problem is that I'm I'm not really finding a lot of good varietal out where I'm at. Um, the my options seem to be like Kansas wildflower, Missouri wildflower, or uh, something that calls itself clover but doesn't really have the distinct clover flavor that I'm I'm hearing clover is supposed to have. Yeah. Um, if I want a varietal, it seems like I've got to have that shipped in from somewhere and. You know, it's not that I don't want to pay for good honey. I don't want to pay for shipping. Yeah, that's the, that's the hard part. <laughs> you know, when the shipping costs darn near as much as the, you know, bucket of honey that you're buying, you know. Well, uh, and a perfect example of this, my wife and I were in Malta last year for our honeymoon. Um, there was a particular varietal of honey there that, I didn't even think about when I was there because we were just getting small sample jars of it. And it was, well, it was one little uh, experience in a whole bunch of different food and like cultural experiences that was kind of overwhelming at the time. But we got back and we got to trying this honey that we brought home and we went, wow, this would make some really phenomenal mead. <laughs> and I, I got to looking at it. And I got to thinking about it. And my options for buying this honey, it turns out, are... Uh, Malta or Southern Spain. And in order to get, you know, a, a big bucket of this honey, you know, like 60, 65, 55, 65 pounds of honey, we're talking $400 in shipping costs. Yeah, right. <laughs> at, at, at that point, it's almost cheaper to say, honey, we're going back. Yeah. Uh, just bring one suitcase <laughs> and we're going to check this extra bucket of honey for each of us on the way back. There you go. Yeah, I, you know, I've done the same thing. I, you know, you get out there online, and I, you know, uh, and uh, we probably won't get to them tonight because I kind of wanted to get to our bucket list here a little bit. We haven't done that in a couple of weeks, but 
you know, while looking, you know, and, and briefly, the best place to go if you're looking online, just go to honey.com. Uh, click on the honey locator deal there. You can go state by state and just look for places. Some of the links are not updated, so some of them are, are dead. Uh, but, you know, you can go state to state, and sometimes you'll run into places that will actually ship honey. Many of them won't, but there's a lot of them that will. But, I, you know, I, I'm looking through some of these, and, you know, like you. I mean, I, I find this. I don't remember what it was. I'm like blueberry or something. And, you know, for 60 pounds, I can get it for like $148. I'm thinking, wow, that's cheap. You know, that's less than what I get at lo- get my wildfire locally. Well, until I put it in the cart and I looked at the shipping, and it's going to be almost $300 to get it here. I thought, wow, that kind of takes the price of that honey way up to the top where I really don't want to be. So, <laughs> but uh, I'm kind of like you. I'm, I'm a little bit stingy when it comes to that and not not – not because I want to spend my money on other things. I just, I, I, I just don't. Uh, I, I don't want to be paying for somebody else's Mercedes Benz. I guess that, I'm just old school about that. Um. So anyway, so yeah, the honey prices uh, they pretty much run the gamut. Uh, you know, they look at like like Aaron says, anywhere from three to seven bucks a pound. My 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 limit is right around five bucks a pound. I mean, if I if you can if you can sell me on some exceptionally great honey, I'll go over that. Uh, but it'll have to be really good stuff. Right now, I, I am really hooked on this wildflower that I get. I mean, it's it's absolutely amazing. I love working with it. And you know what? When it comes down to it, I may just stick with one or two different styles of mead. And maybe that's all I want to do, um, you know. Um, but uh, let's uh, – it's getting kind of late. I, I wanted to go through the bucket list and find out where everybody's at. Let's start out with Aaron. Uh, what's on your bucket list? Uh, what's in your bucket list or what's on your – what did we call it? Bucket list? No. Was it the, the bucket list or the hopper? Or? The hopper. What's in the hopper? The bucket <laughs> list. Don't get well, old. <laughs> <laughs> right now, so really the, the main thing that's going on here at the uh, the old Martin Meadery this past weekend, I racked my hop experiment t- from primary to secondary. Mm. So, um, again, these are, are three one-gallon batches comparing three different types of hops. The, the Chinook, which is going to be a, a like a piney, resiny type of a hop. Um, the Calypso, which is going to be more of like a fruity, citrusy type of, of hop. And then lastly, the Crystal Hop, which is, is going to be more of like a floral flavor. Um, you know, racked all those to secondary and had, had little tastes of each of them. Um, interesting results so far. Um, surprisingly, are you, I, are you pleased pardon? with them? Are you, are you pleased I, with the tastings of them? I am. Yeah, definitely. In general, I, I am very pleased with the, the taste. Um, I have to say this was my first experience using an ale yeast and um, the flavor that I'm getting is very reminiscent of the meads that I had from Golden Coast. Um, the, yeah, yeah. the the meadery out there in, what is it, San Diego, I want to say. So, yeah, Oceanside, uh, yeah. Yep. Um, you know, I, I think I had really high hopes for that Calypso hop just in, in reading the description and to be honest with you, it just came out probably the the most flat of the bunch I, I definitely get the 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 citrusy flavor it's kind of like a lemon lime like a sprite almost type oh. of a flavor uh, but just maybe a little bit flat probably the citrus or I'm sorry the the crystal the floral one was the one that I expected to like the least and and that was my favorite i I think um just that floral flavor really played very well with with the basswood honey so all in all definitely pleased with where these are at and excited to kind of keep keep monitoring them here as as they continue to age out and clarify yeah outstanding mississippi what you got in the hopper bud besides i know you got that cherry thing going yeah, I've got the cherry going. I got my uh, sour wood traditional going. Uh, doing it a little bit different than I normally do. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, got the uh, the coffee mead experiment number one, and then number two also, which was a little variation that I did. Um, and it got the uh, chocolate orange over into mm-hmm. tertiary now. Uh, it's finally cleared up. It doesn't look like Guatemalan goat puke <laughs> anymore. Yeah. And uh, and about to start the uh, the strawberry chocolate. I've been wanting to do it ever since I started the chocolate orange. So okay. we'll get it going sometime here in the next week, probably. Yeah. Excellent. Jeff, uh, what's in the hopper? Okay. Well, let's see. Um, at the moment, I've got uh, I I actually just bottled up the last of my kit beer for the big Fourth of July bash we got going on next weekend. Um, so the big fermenters are all open, um, getting ready to fill those up again. Um, in secondary, I've got that Cherimoya mead. I've been a little bit res- reticent to, uh, try that again just cause it was really harsh the last time I tried it, but it's been sitting around for about a month. It's about time to rack that into another container and get some of the sediment off and, uh, see where we're at with that one. That may still be a lost cause, but we don't know. Um, of course I've got the, the, uh, the coffee boche, um, that's, oh, I want to say that's coming up on uh, needing a racking within the next week or two, too. Um, get that off of the uh, the primary and into secondary. Um, I've got a uh, my own um, hop session mead in experiment, and I've uh, this weekend I'm putting together a couple gallons of a dry uh, wildflower um, session mead just to. Uh, to cut that with because I used way too much hops in that one and it just came out really strong compared to previous batches. Um, then, uh, in addition this weekend, I'm also going to be doing, uh, the, uh, the, the Chris's multi berry session mead and, um, working on getting the, the wiring done for this fridge so I can get started on a big get batch of the, uh, the biscuits and gamma meal. Mm, there you go. How's the beehives coming? <laughs> well, um, let's see. Last last week, I had to uh, try and replace a uh, a queen that wasn't laying very well, um, right. like yeah. you do. She uh, she just didn't come through for me. And I checked her out Friday evening uh, after I got home from work. Uh, went through the hive, and I didn't see any evidence of new eggs. There was some uncapped larva in there. Um, I didn't see the queen, so that. Yeah, all in all, that's not a good sign at all. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it, it seems like the queen probably wasn't taken. Um, probably tomorrow, since the forecast is uh, going to be clear, I'll be uh, getting into that hive again. Um, we'll see. Uh, that bitch is probably out flirting with another hive somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we'll uh, see if there's uh, there's any eggs or uncapped larvae in there at that point, because yeah. um, that'll be about a week and a half from uh, from when I, I killed the non-laying queen. Um, so any of the last last few uh, eggs that she laid will have been capped and uh, doing their thing. Um, and if if we don't have a queen, then I'm going to have to start, start making some tough decisions as far as the future of this hive um, yeah, and well, what I'm going to do to save it. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll keep us updated on that. Now, the other hive is just kicking ass and taking names. Um, it's I've actually had to put another a whole other box on top of it because um, there are so many bees in there. They are spilling out the front. Um, they're just shoulder to shoulder and constantly overheating and trying to fan the hive and keep everything cool and, um, temperate in there. So, um, this, uh, this other hive, I think I'm going to get a pretty good harvest out of this year, even though, you know, I really shouldn't expect that from a first year hive. So we'll kind of see. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, keep us updated on, on your, uh, on your beekeeping efforts there. Absolutely. Um, what does JD have in the hopper? Uh, well, I started a couple of, you know, I had to do something with that, with that caramelized honey that I did. Uh, I actually wound up with four quarts of, of that, um, uh, wildflower. I, I did that other two quarts that uh, came out a little bit darker, a little bit different flavor. So I put a couple of more coffee projects 
found some some really nice coffee locally here. Uh, I did it with eight ounces instead of four ounces this time. Cold brew, uh, just like we did before. Very interested in Patty Mackey. We had her on the show tonight talking to her about her. Uh, she mentioned the fact that she did a coffee and uh, just you know cold brewed her mead on top of the uh, on top of the coffee beans. I'm interested in trying that. Uh, I don't have enough open fermenters at the moment to do it uh, as far as test batches go, but I did manage to rack my Chardonnay wine today uh, into secondary, so it will finish out there. I'm not expecting to uh, do anything with it for probably another oh, maybe six, seven months. Uh, so it's, uh, it's in the, uh, I have this new cooling rack that I made that's also fed by my really expensive cooler that's still like 32 degrees on day four. Um, and I, uh, I've got two open fermenters with, my, oh, and by the way, that hibiscus project that I did with your recipe it's yeah. done. It's done. It's one. It's like it hasn't done anything for like the last, oh, maybe four or five days. It's at one zero 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 zero. That's it. Um, that's where right it's at. Isn't it? And it's it's tart. Uh, it's a, it's a little on the hot side. Sixteen uh, percent alcohol uh, with that D forty seven. Um. And it's, it's just a, it's a little it's got a little bit of, a little bit of hot to it. I'm hoping that's just going to kind of go away in time. Um, that may need to age out. You you know um, it it may be the kind of thing where um, the for whatever reason your batch came out a little bit different than ours. You may even want to look at back sweetening it back sweetening it a little bit more than you had before mm-hmm. um, because. You know, we may prefer a drier wine than you do. I mean, this is yeah. Oh, I like a dry wine. Um, so, I, I, yeah, so actually, I, is a, I, I uh, go ahead. Well, I was going to say it is also you know a pretty dry, um, not not a pretty dry, a pretty young mead. So yeah, you you may just need a little a uh, little more time for it before it really starts to to hit its own. So, I mean, I. Uh, it's got a very, um, it's got a, a very unique flavor. It's, uh, it's, it just reminds me of organic gardening. That's the first thing that came to my mind, for whatever <laughs> reason. Uh, but I like the taste. I like the flavor. Um, it's, I, I like the tartness, uh, and I think that along with the alcohol will probably calm down just a little bit. Uh, but I like it. I mean, I, I, I think it's going to turn out all right. Um, you know, I, I think what I'm going to do is, uh, and I may, I may, you know, I've got two gallons, or not quite full gallons, uh, because I racked it out of my little, my little two-gallon bucket. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, ha- I had to leave some behind, and I, I had just enough to put into two-gallon jugs. Uh, and if I rack them both off of the uh, spent yeast in both of them, I'll probably wind up with. Oh, maybe a good gallon and a half. Uh, so I may do that later on tonight. Um, the sourwood, uh, Chris, I'm sorry, bud, but the sourwood, it's on the back burner. Right? It's just sitting over in the corner by itself. If it bubbles, fine. If it doesn't, the hell with it. Uh, it'll be a 10%, uh, you know, mead. Uh, I st- it's a little on the sweet side for me. It tastes good. Uh, but I don't know what else to do with it. I've done, you know, and I, I, I did the slow route on new yeast, you know, uh, a cup at a time, you know, in a new fermenter. I mean, to, you know, in a new carboy until I got it all racked over. That was over the course of a couple of days and, you know, nothing. So it bubbles mm-hmm. every now and again. I can see, you know, I can see bubbles drifting up uh, if you stare at it long enough you can see there's activity in it and once in a while the airlock will throw out a bubble or two but it's just you know like i said it's over in the corner that's where it's going to stay you know in a couple of months i'll look at it again and see you know take another reading and see if it's moved 
one day it may just take off for no reason. Well, Meg, you know, um, yeah. I hesitate to add any kind of any kind of honey or anything sweet to it. It's already sweet. I mean, it, it, gosh, it seems like it would be plumped over sugar there to do something. Um, yeah. I can't imagine. I mean, it's only ten percent alcohol. I can't imagine that would be enough to kill. Uh, you know, a, a, a nice uh, a nice starter. Uh, so, um, and I even raised the temperature. Uh, I mean, it's just sitting out in the open at like 72 degrees. So, mm. I've done everything I know. I uh, yeah, I, I can't think of anything else to do to it. I, and I, I can't figure out why it stalled like that. All right. Uh, just one of those, I guess, you have to just chalk it up to uh, to a loss and move on. Well, you know, it may not be a complete loss. Uh, you know, I can, it's just going to sit there. And like I said, if it clears out uh, and winds up being just a 10% mead, then fine. It's going to be on the sweet side. I can, you know, fix up, a, a, do up a batch of wildflower traditional, let it run dry with some, you know, 1118, and maybe combine the two to try to cut that sweetness in the sourwood. I don't know. But uh, for now. Sure. That's, you know. that's always an option. Yeah. So, yeah, we're not going to we're not going to toss it. We're just going to put it on the back burner. Yeah. Or use it for any other project that comes out a little too dry. You can always use that to sweeten it up. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it reminds me, uh, Jeff, I think the, I, I'm wondering now if that tartness didn't come from that blackberry honey that I used. You know, that's a possibility. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't know how much that would have contributed, but, you know. Well, I mean, without having tasted the, the honey used uh, myself, you know, it, it's possible. I, I, it may be uh, the. <laughs> I'm not a good honey taster, you know. I'm, I'm just not. I mean, I, I can't. I, I can taste this wildflower, and I can tell you that it smells like you're standing in a flower garden. It has an incredible sweetness to it. It has zero burn going down the throat. I mean, it's just it's wonderful stuff. Um, makes you want to lick the inside of the bucket when it's empty. Um, the blackberry, I couldn't tell you what it tastes like. I just, I'm just, I'm not a honey taster. I mean, that wildflower is basically the only thing that I've had. You know. Well, and with any other recipe, I would tell you, you know, that's it's a distinct possibility. Um, I do know for a fact that uh, that hibiscus chamomile, the hibiscus, has plenty of tartness to it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that that Occam's razor of the most uh, most likely aspect being. The uh, the one that's probably it, uh, it's it's probably at least partly the hibiscus, yeah, um, because that's that's she's, the hibiscus is just really dark. Um, now, like like I said before, it's still young; it may cool down. I mean, I think. Uh,